Um, so welcome again. Um, today uh, we're hosting a discussion between uh, Morik Rose and Blake Morris. Uh, Blake is a walking artist and researcher based in New York City, where currently he's suffering through a heat wave if the temperature reaches 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, I think only Americans really know how hot that is because I have no clue, although we just talked about it and it might be around 27 degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, besides uh, suffering through a heat wave, uh, amongst many other things, his work focuses on participatory walking practices and walking together at a distance. He recently published the book Walking Networks, this was last year if I remember correctly, which identifies the unique attributes of walking to develop a definition for walking as an artistic medium. Um, and uh, I wish we uh, would have this book as one of the books offer in, offered in our um, uh, collection of books, but uh, for us it's a little bit inaccessible, which is the topic of today's talk, because the price is uh, something like 90 pounds in the UK. Um, That's very expensive. <laughs> he, yeah. He also recently guest edited uh, the upcoming edition of Street Notes, which is set to be released in, no, uh, in June, so this month, um, and he is currently uh, walking together remotely through his 52 scores project, or another 52, I think it is called, uh, because it's a second set. And uh, Morak is a self-identified anarcho-flaneuse um, and walking artist, activist, academic, who co-founded co the Loiterers Resistance Movement, uh, the LRM, in Manchester in 2006. And the LRM is a psychogeographical collective um, based in, as I said, Manchester, which, amongst other things, hosts a psychogeographic walk, uh, but more recently, remotely, I believe, every first Sunday of the month. And um, amongst many things, um, uh, she has created urban interventions such as CCTV bingo and human fox hunts. And those were without foxes, but with humans. Now, back in 2018, so this is now moving towards the topic of um, uh, today's uh, talk. Back in 2018, Blake and Morak embarked on a distance walking exchange to explore disability, intersectionality, and interdependence in relation to walking, in part inspired by Judith Butler's and Sunara Taylor's walk in Examined Life. And if you haven't seen it, it's a nice uh, little video. It's available on YouTube. It's only 10 minutes, and it's worth uh, watching. Um, the resulting article from uh, their talks and walks uh, offered a series of provocations encouraging readers to walk with someone who walks differently than you, um, and both together and at a distance, which is also what they themselves did as part of that article. Uh, and now, as a kind of follow-up to that exchange, this discussion between Blake and Morak will consider the complex relationship between diverse bodies, cyberspace, and movement while addressing the challenges and opportunities of digital access, particularly in the context of our lockdown of the last 18 months. And they ask, as we move towards walking together in person again, how can we integrate into our practice the contradictions and differences these moments have highlighted? Over to you, Morak and Blake. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, and I think that, unless Morak has something to add, we're just going to start immediately with a, a reading of our provocations, um, and then we will give you context <laughs> post the reading. Uh, so I will, for the only time probably, share my screen. Um, the title of the article is Pedestrian Provocations, Manifesting an Accessible Future. Invite someone who walks differently than you to go for a walk. Choose a place to walk together in the future. Pick a date. Meet your friend at the previously chosen time and place. Walk together and map the technological supports that provide you access. If there are barriers to access, map those as well. Walk apart from your friend. Look for absences. Who is not where you are and why? Keep an eye out for supports that are for other users of the city. As you walk, are there textures, sounds or visual cues that might help or inhibit you if you were in a different body. 
Create a new code for moving through the city. Take your map and assign each barrier slash support a way to move, play, or interact with the city. Be creative and code how you please. Invite someone to walk with you following your codes. Set out and seek traces, layers, clues, ghost signs. How was this place built? For whom? Decode flotsam and jetsam. Perhaps the rubbish will be revealing. Invite an old friend for a walk. Create a new code with them, one that only the two of you can decipher. Meet somewhere else. Walk your code together. Walk your code apart. Share it digitally. Create a walking instruction for each other. Walk your friend's instruction. Ask someone to direct you to the heart of the landscape. Get there without using a map or your phone, unless, of course, someone draws you a map, in which case that is brilliant luck. Collate the instructions, scores, diagrams, maps, and pictures into a walking guide for someone else. Invite them to try out your guide and make one of their own. So that was a series of provocations that Morag and I developed over the course of about a year as we walked together and apart. And what this came out of was I had submitted an article to Global Performance Studies focused on my the walking I had done in my doctoral practice um, through distance and digital exchange. And they wrote back to me that they were really interested in my research, but uh, for the way that the issue was going, they would prefer me to write on walking and disability. And that was something that I was very interested in and excited about. However, as an able-bodied person, I did not feel it was appropriate for me to solo author a paper on walking and disability. Um, and I considered something that I had heard Morag say to me quite, quite often, not to me specifically perhaps, but a, you know, an idea that she had introduced to me quite a few times, which is nothing about us without us. And I couldn't think of anyone that I would rather engage in this conversation or dialogue with than Morag. And so I emailed her with an invitation to join me in creating a new piece of work that would reflect on these questions around walking and disability and access. So I got Blake's email and it was a very quick, um, yes, he mentioned nothing about us without us. Um, that's been a, a slogan for the disabled people's movement for a really long time. Um, and, you know, amongst many things, I'm a crip. It's probably about the 38th most interesting thing about me, and that's on a boring day, you know. It, it's not what defines my work or my practice, but as a walking artist, I, I can't deny the fact that actually sometimes walking is very painful, and there's times in my life when I can't do it. And actually, if you meet people from where I grew up, they're absolutely astonished that I've made a art form out of a thing that I'm historically terrible at. Um, so I'm always interested in exploring this. However, something I'd like to add about Blake's invitation was that it was very collegiate and very collaborative, and, and we have a history. Um, I've often been invited as a token crip or indeed as a token queer or token woman or token working class person, and that is not a good invitation. That's never open. If you're asking somebody because you need to tick a diversity, block, uh, diversity box, it's not a good start to a collaboration. However, um, Blake's phrasing was, you know, not patronizing, was clearly keying into things I'm interested in for a long time, and indeed building a, a walking community that values diverse bodies and diverse ways of walking is something that I've been committed to for a very long time. So, yeah, and thanks. I will, say, I will say there was also a sense that it was a peer-reviewed academic article, and I knew that both Morag and I were sort of in the process of of starting um, or of, of finishing our PhDs and, and moving through this. And so I also thought, you know, I really want to work with someone who also um, has that desire and that that move towards creating new peer-reviewed work, which is a which is different was different for me at the time. 
um, and I think probably different, I don't want to speak for Morag, but um, in terms of a, a different sort of way of applying our artistic practice. Um, and I guess this is kind of a side note, but that peer review process radically changed the work that we ended up creating in the end. Um, and I don't know who those reviewers were, but I will thank them without knowing who they were for the, the real support and interest and engagement they gave us that forced us to really rethink our structure of how we were presenting this work to an audience. Um, yeah. But the, the first thing that we did was just, we watched the Judith Butler and Sonara Taylor video, which as Babak mentioned, is, is very good, very short and very accessible. Um, and one of the key themes in that is the, the notion of interdependence. And so this is, I think, one of the starting points for more agonized exploration was how was moving past the idea of independence to one of interdependence. And Dee Hedden is in the room as well, and her work with Sue Porter on walking in interconnections um, was also happening kind of around that time. And that was very inspiring for us too, in terms of the way that we were asking people to think about what it means to walk together in different bodies and through different spaces and through different times. Um, and so Morag and I walked apart and together we walked simultaneously and asynchronously. Um, I was often in London and she was in Manchester um, and we continued a correspondence through a variety of different tools, including WhatsApp and email, uh, phone conversations and in-person meetings. Yeah, um, just to explain that a little bit further, um, when we walked synchronously but apart, I was usually in Manchester in the city centre um, in a particular neighbourhood that is a site of um, intense gentrification and at that time in particular various um, battles around historical buildings that were being destroyed um, and the kind of history connected with working class um, northern British cultures in particular um, and Blake was often in Walthamstow on kind of cruising grounds so very different kinds of um, locations and we would swap photos and we would have conversations um, and direct each other in different ways using their scores. We met and walked together um, in real time twice during the course of this article. The first time we met in London, um, not by accident, we started in the um, British Library Cafe and actually um, Blake coincidentally managed to rescue me from quite an awkward question, awkward conversation with a woman who uh, saw my loiterer badge. And when we think about invitation, it was an invitation for her to start talking to me. And when you have those conversations with strangers that are often a delight, and then there's a point when um, they're quite problematic and you're wondering what to do. So he rescued me. And um, not that I often need rescuing. It's the one and only time, I think. Uh, we then wandered King's Cross, um, explored the area and ended up in the basement of Houseman's Bookshop where um, Doreen Mass's, or part of her library was for sale. Uh, she's another theorist and writer whose work profoundly influenced me. So um, it was a, a strange and slightly awkward pleasure to be looking through her, um, the, the remains of her book collection. Um, we later met in Cardiff where we were co-chairing a session at the RGS conference that was called Desire Lines, Dawdles and Drifts, Walking Together as Research. And during that time, we went for walks with um, a number of other walking artists, um, writers and researchers who happened to be there. Um, those walks tended, as I recall, to be very playful, often fueled by the copious amounts of free wine um, and included conversations on um, regional dialect words for squirrels. Um, I grew up with squizzers. If anyone's got any other um, names, I'd be happy to know. Um, and I'm telling you these because it kind of illustrates something about our practice that really valued slow scholarship. And although the walks are very durational and limited in time, we kind of stretched it as far as we could um, to make the process of producing the article of walking together uh, stretched out in that kind of time is quite elastic. And, and to echo what Blake said, that the Editors were really helpful. Um, my tendency as a you know, psychogeographer is to derive and drift and ramble and learning about structure was very useful. Um, and as we wrote and we walked and we thought together, we were particularly considering how walking can be an active invitation of reciprocity, um, of 
provocation and conversation, all those points are really important to our work. I've often described my own walks as having a conversation with people in the environment and provoking awkward questions, difficult conversations. Um, and we wanted to think as well about who is invited to walk when we issue an invitation to walk with us, um, when and where, and how we can extend an invitation to walk with us to a variety of walkers and indeed non-walkers. Um, and that in itself is a, a an interesting term because people often do not define themselves as walkers in the way they might define themselves as cyclists or car drivers or skiers or other kinds of transport um, where actually they may be walking. And I've always been keen very much throughout my work, and I know Blake is too, to say that we have an expanded view of walking that always includes things like wheelchairs um, and assistive technologies like sticks, uh, prosthetics, orthotics and such like that. And one of, one of the things about um we did keep coming back to this notion of invitation, and this is something that I've actually continued to be really interested in, is how we frame the, the act of inviting someone to walk with us. And one of the things that that um, experience in the British Library, when Morag's loiterer's badge sort of invited that woman to talk to her, it also kind of changed my perspective on how this collaboration invitation happened. Because while ostensibly I was the one who invited Morad to write this article with me, in some way that made me think, oh, but actually the reason for that invitation was because of Morad, Morag's long-term research and walking practice and generosity as a scholar and a colleague and a friend that made me feel like, like she invited me to invite her, I felt like in some ways, because I was, I was so interested in the work she was doing and, and her generosity as a scholar. Um, that, you know, I didn't feel like I was coming in and being like, Maura, come and do this. I felt like it was really a, a reciprocal and collaborative act. And that is something that I have really wanted to think about because for any walk, the first thing is, is the invitation. Who am I inviting? How am I inviting them? Where am I inviting them? And what points of access, um, different modalities and different approaches can I take to invite them? Um, in, in order to create, you know, accessible, inclusive walks that in, interrogate the systems and structures that support our walks. Um, and Morag and I spent a lot of time really thinking seriously about what the signs of the street were and how different aspects of the street and the textures of the street, and that was in one of those prompts, um, invite us to walk. And I found myself noticing different ways that the city was designed for people who walked it differently than me that I had taken for granted before. So, you know, the, the sort of bumps coming up to a street corner so that you know that you're about to get to a street. It was something that I knew existed, but I had never actively considered and interrogated in my own practice. I guess another thing that, this is the idea, is that multiple points of access, multiple tools, and how many different ways we can create um, to make sure that people can walk with us regardless of what kind of access they have to digital tools. Because that was something, as someone who, is, who has often not had a smartphone, uh, or if I've had a smartphone, I've not had a contract to pay for data, um, sometimes simultaneous walks using different modes of digital access and data have been very challenging for me because I couldn't, I, I felt like I couldn't go on them because I didn't have the tools. So we were also trying to think about questions around that. How can we how can we create digital walks that bring access to people who are in digital deserts, who don't have data plans, who don't have smartphones or have access, whose internet access is limited? Um, and I think that became a, a really important point for us to also start to think about when the editors asked me to write about walking and disability and they recommended that I watch this Judith Butler and Sonara Taylor um, video, I think they did have a sense of ability as something very much like, all right, I, we're sending you a video of someone who is a wheelchair user that is very clearly a kind of disability uh, in relation to walking. But I think through this process of working with Morag, um, we really started to think about how we can look at that more holistically. Yeah, thank you. So um, this concept of thinking around access holistically is something that I've been working with um, for a really long time. I think even before I necessarily 
had the words to um, explain it and what I mean. So, for example, it's not just about physical barriers. And even if we just think about access just for disabled people, you know, that doesn't just mean wheelchairs. It means uh, maybe people who have chronic illnesses that require regular access to public toilets. Or it means having street furniture so people can have a have a sit down if they need to. And it means thinking about a material physical environment that is as open and accessible to as many people as possible. And to not see that as a challenge or a negative, but see that as an, an opening up, you know, actually what is good for somebody who is um, who does need a wheelchair is good for somebody who's pushing a buggy or has a big suitcase with them or is just a bit tired or has temporarily broken the leg. You know, there are all kinds of situations. Um, we also might want to think about neurodiversity and sensory impairments as well when we think about the environment. Um, and bear in mind that, you know, we people have different needs at different times in their lives. Um, however, this holistic view of access isn't just about the material and physical needs of bodies. It's also about factors such as street harassment, feelings of safety, of fear, of an interesting environment, and of things like cultural restrictions on walking. These are as important and as excluding as physical barriers, and often they are invisible unless they impact you yourself, you know. Um, around the time of writing this article, uh, Blake was quite right that there was the, uh, the desire to develop um, different kinds of writing skills. But my own um, PhD study had focused on women's experiences of walking in Manchester. And I took an intersectional feminist approach to that, which recognized that, you know, there's no such thing as a singular woman's body. You know, we have different needs at different times in our life, indeed different times in the day. And people are impacted in different ways. Um, and what I was struck actually was how harassment and limits on movement based on uh, often very, you know, very well-founded fear had limits for all kinds of women, whether it was because they had experienced racism or transphobia or street harassment or sexual abuse. These things limit. And, you know, we can we can go on. I don't want to list all the things that put up these invisible barriers. But to me, that cultural shift, that desire is as important as physical barriers. And that also does include thinking about the digital tools we use and how accessible they are, not just in terms of, again, physical access. Um, and if any of you have seen my website, you'll realize that um, it's far from perfect in this way. You know, we all learn as we go along what can be made better. But it's also about things like the cost of technology, um, as Blake mentioned, and also maybe ethical restrictions as well. If the digital tools that we are using are in corporate space and are data mining and are using things, what does that impact? And certainly my own work with the LRM, I've always been very keen that um, a central tenet of the group, the closest we have to a motto, is that the streets belong to everybody. And we try to make that so in all kinds of ways. Um, and that applies to digital streets, digital spaces, as well as public spaces. So what are the ways that we can enable technology to not exclude on grounds of cost or ability? And actually, what kind of compromises do we have to make to do that? And, and how do we reconcile the fact that, that there is no one perfect solution to these questions of access that we're asking? Um, and they became ever more pertinent uh, during lockdown. And that question of corporate space is actually something that when I was at the Royal Geographical Society, I was in or at the conference that Morag and I were at together. There was a, a talk where somebody asked about, they were asking about Twitter and WhatsApp and um, they were t particularly talking about Twitter as like a public space or a public comment. And someone raised their hand and went, but actually isn't this a corporate space? It's, it's more akin to a privately owned public space that I'm now forgetting the particular name of uh, in no privately owned public space is the British yeah, version. Oops. And in America, it's a private public partnership, a PPP. But so Twitter becomes more more akin to those kinds of spaces than to an actual public commons or a public sphere. 
And so navigating the, you know, Morag and I are both interested in, in subverting capitalist paradigms and, you know, creating new kinds of spaces outside of these corporate data mining spaces. But we also have to be pragmatic about points of access for people to make sure that they can, they have different tools that they're already using um, in order to engage with us. So that's, I think, a contradiction that we're both sort of still sorting through in our practice, you know, that inclusivity and wider access versus some of these more pure, um, <laughs> idealistic notions of how we should be creating space for our communities of walkers. Absolutely. And uh, for both of us, I think that this um, tension has been um, exacerbated like so much else during the lockdown and during the pandemic and how we've had to change and adapt our own practices. So um, my own uh, walks the, at the kind of heart of most of what I do is the LRM, the Lawyers Resistance Movement. And we've been walking together now for around 15 years, um, just over that actually. Um, on the first Sunday of every month, we have a derive or a public game or a performance tour. It's always been really important that they are free, that they are communal, that they are actively participatory, and that they are, you know, we talk about um, creative mischief and uh, keeping public space interesting and alive. And that's been a really important um, thing to us. Now, we've experimented with different things over the years, but essentially that's been the, the core of what we do. Uh, there's several paradoxes and, and problems here, you know, not least that we're rooted in psychogeography, um, and yet we're, you know, we know we're part of the spectacle now. And particularly as we go... Um, online i mean for a long time the lrm have had a presence on twitter and facebook that is not unproblematic but has enabled us to have many conversations with people um not just physically on the street so in some ways it's an extension and i you know i freely admit there is always attention and i think that's one of the things that we thrive on but during covid19 um we couldn't meet on the street as well so everything went online and we've experimented with various ways of walking together apart, um, primarily using WhatsApp because it's free and easy to use on even a fairly low tech phone. Um, we also simultaneously do things on Twitter um, and we have texted people or posted things out to people who have uh, wanted to join in in other ways. Although as we've been online, I'm, I'm very conscious that they've still had to have some basic technology to find find out what we're doing. Um, and I said, during lockdown, we experimented with various formats. And it's been fun, and it's been frustrating. And at times, it's been heartbreaking, to be honest, because I miss, I miss touch, and I miss the embodied sensory experience, and the serendipity of meeting with people. The digital world loses some of the serendipity, I think. Um, certainly when there's, you know, delay times and, you know, breaks in Wi-Fi, and we may find beauty in that and joy in that and useful conversations but it's not the same and it would be wrong for me to say otherwise um just a reflection a little bit on how we how the lrm has changed during lockdown um it's been fascinating to me we've obviously reached many new people people who are much further away than manchester who could never come to us we've always been very physically locally rooted in in our city um, and the people that have come to us from afar, some of them have been loiterers who've moved away. Many of them have just seen us online and been curious and not been able to get to the city. So there's been some really uh, wonderful new connections. Although, interestingly, many of the people that will come a lot have preferred to take a step back and walk asynchronously or use the tools in their own time and communicate in different ways because I think they felt the loss of the conviviality in a way um, so it's been really interesting. And I think I would also say we were born in a in an anarchist social centre and in a very free space. So those politics have been very central to my work, um, although not everybody that comes would agree with them. I do feel like as we've walked separately, because we're in different places, we've been perhaps less small 
rather rather less overtly political and perhaps more social and I think there's an intense value in that when people are isolated and you know alienated and we might want to think about um you know the radical potential of kindness and exchange as well so I'm still processing these ideas and I'm also still trying to decide what we will do when we are able to meet in person again because I do not want to alienate or reject the people that cannot come and I need to find some kind of hybrid so that we can be together and apart at the same time um, and we don't quite know when that will be we've just been put back on the naughty step in Manchester so um, I don't yet know when we'll be able to walk in person but um, over to Blake for his yeah and look so um, my experience going into lockdown and sort of how that changed my practice was a, a bit different than Morag's. I had just moved to Northampton after spending five years in London doing my PhD. I got a job at the University of Northampton um, where there is not a huge walking community. As I lived there longer, I understood that there was more of a Midlands walking community than I realized, but it is much more centered in Birmingham, I would say, than in Northampton. Um, and so that was something that I was interested in developing was was figuring out how can I how can I start to create a walking community in Northampton. Um, but lockdown happened, and <laughs> suddenly um, bringing people together in Northampton to walk with me wasn't really an option anymore. Um, so my focus had to really shift fully to the to the digital world. Um, but I focused mostly on non-simultaneous walks and creating walks that people could respond to a prompt wherever they are in whatever way they possibly can. So one of the projects that I started during right before lockdown was uh, called British Summertime, and it was a week of walks leading up to the time change. And so I ask anyone from anywhere in the world to walk from 15 minutes before sunrise until 15 minutes after sunrise, um, take a photo at the beginning, middle, and end, and then share them to create this kind of connection. And the first one was prior to lockdown, and I had started to really invite colleagues and people I knew in Northampton. But the second one was right after lockdown had begun. And so suddenly it really did become about these connections when I was feeling quite isolated, when, when I was very much experiencing what Morag was talking about, living alone in an apartment in a town where I didn't really know anyone, um, and feeling that this community that had formed through the Walking Artist Network and through the different people interested in walking art um, was something that I really needed and that really kept me going, actually, in almost a, you know, I don't know how I would have gotten through it all without that community formation that had been building over the years. And I guess because I'd already been exploring what it means to walk together apart and how we can take local practice and share it globally through digital tools, um, you know, that, that fit in well, I suppose. Uh, And the, the other thing that was really important to me in terms of, you know, for the sun, Sunrise Walk series was this idea that you can do it wherever you are on whatever your terms are. So if you are someone that can only, that it takes them 15 minutes to walk a very short amount of time, then that short amount of space, and that's totally fine because there are no, there's no need. There's no 50 paces or, you know, you need to walk for three miles. It's really about adjusting these practices. And that's, in my latest projects with Babak mentioned 52 scores and 52 more, um, it's really for me about inviting people to interpret walking instructions and prompts in whatever way fits with their body and their location and their interests and not trying to impose um, that on, not trying to impose some type of walking, but allowing an openness for you to interpret these in whatever way works for your body. And that's something that I'm have become increasingly interested in is comparing the different results. So if we've all got a set of walking instructions that we're then applying in Northampton and in New York City and in Fresno, California and in Sao Paulo and in Manchester and in Germany, you know, you have all these different people in different places that as Dee Hedden has said before, everyone brings their own walking encyclopedia uh, to a walk. And so it, it, in some ways this became it became a way for me to think about 
these different local practices through this global exchange. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that happened was everyone during the lockdown period had very different restrictions for what they could and they couldn't do. So for some people, it was, I'm not allowed to walk a mile and a half, like, you know, I think what two kilometers at one point was all I was allowed to walk outside of my house. But some of the people I was interacting with in America, where lockdown was, you know, really very different, depending on what state you were in and much more lax than it was at that time in the UK, had a very different experience. So it also started to really raise up questions about local access in times of, of public crisis and public trauma and gl global um, approaches as, as we are all globally experiencing this same pandemic, but our local responses to it are, are so varied, um, which is becoming more and more problematic because we can't, act, those borders aren't actually re real. And I think that that's one of the things that the pandemic has really revealed to me at least is, is you know, the fallacy of borders and what that means in terms of our explorations as walkers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that the the pandemic globally and as it has also played out in, you know, specific locations as well, has exacerbated and revealed, if, if you were already not aware of them, uh, many, many existing inequalities and has entrenched them further. So, you know, on a, on a positive level, uh, being able to be clear that you could now take part in LRM walks wherever you are and however you are and whether you are indoors or outdoors. I, I made very careful uh, curatorial decisions really about walks that could be done alone, inside, outside, however you were. Um, it, it also raises, you know, other kinds of of questions, um, you know, profoundly as a as a geographer, you know, a border is a line on a map that is more than a line on the map, it reveals all kinds of power relations. And I've always encouraged people to think about, imagine drawing our own maps and seeing how that feels to have that control and what matters to you in a map. However, that shouldn't disguise the very real uh, threats and problems that people you know, face. Uh, what of people who are not allowed or able to cross borders? How can we um, involve them and, and energize them and, you know, support them actually in our practices and show solidarity in practical ways beyond merely, you know, talking about a, a fantasy where there are no borders? Um, and what is the distinction between a national border or a quarantined area or a area where you require a vaccine passport or a border wall so these are bigger questions than any one walk but i think they're very central to what we think about at the moment you know the combination of physical material barriers legal barriers and those invisible cultural barriers um just one small um aspect of our walks when we meet in the, the real world we've always been very clear that uh tempting as it may be we don't engage in um trespass or urban exploration on a first sunday because we want people who are um who would be struggling in a circumstance where they were arrested and that is often primarily because of their um immigration status or caring responsibilities or such like we find a lot of kind of radical psychogeographers will be um, advocating things that may be fine on paper, but actually exclude many people from engaging in those forms of exploration. So that's one example we meet in the real world, but how this translates to um, digital is a really uh, important and real question. And I think at the core of my work and also of Blake's, I think we both feel very strongly that as walk facilitators or um, and as artists, and I always slightly struggle to describe my role in the LRM, it's usually like chief mischief maker or something like that. I, I feel very strongly and firmly and passionately that we have a duty of care, um, that everyone who comes on our walks uh, 
yes, must take care of themselves, but also must take care of other people and the environment where we are. So this can be as simple as, you know, not blocking a pavement to uh, making sure that we keep pace with the slowest of a group. And that duty of care um, is multifaceted and absolutely extends, I think, to the digital realm, although it may sometimes feel slippier and harder to to enact really, and, and again, we learn as we go along. Um, and I think there are questions about how appropriate it is to be making art in the time of trauma. You know, I faced criticism uh, in the past, and I, I personally feel like making art and continuing to walk sensitively and lightly and lovingly is actually a very valid and important response. Um, I'm thinking here, uh, some of you may be aware that um, a few years ago in Manchester, there was a, a bomb which killed um, a, a number of primarily um, young women at a, at a concert. And we had a first Sunday walk, maybe two or three weeks after, and faced some quite public criticism for carrying on walking, whereas I felt it would be far more disrespectful and far more problematic to not do what we were doing. Now, we kept away from the area where there were public trines we made sure that we were you know behaving in ways that we felt were appropriate but for me to stay home to stay in to be fearful would be much more disrespectful than walking in the way that we did and we felt the same in the pandemic although clearly it's different the duty of care I feel is why we haven't met in the real world where we can you know and a need to now navigate when we are able to meet again, when, when it feels OK and appropriate legally to do so. Um, how do we negotiate space? Uh, we've never ticketed LRM events. As I said, they're always free and people turn up. Will I need to think of ways of limiting numbers or will we need to kind of issue some instructions? Or what happens if somebody has a radically different interpretation of appropriate behavior? You know, um, uh, our other kind of sub slogan after the streets belong to everyone is, you know, don't be an arse. And we've been very fortunate that people tend to take on that communal care role quite well. We haven't had um, issues of arseiness. But again, I can see that there may be conflicts that haven't manifested yet because we haven't met together. Um, and I think actually this also extends even to taking up that space in public. Um, and another, a, a slight tangent, but uh, certainly in Manchester, I suspect in other places, um, everybody's relationship or many people's relationship to walking, particularly locally, particularly attentively, has changed quite radically. Our city or the city I live in has been long dominated by uh, cars and individual transport. And actually now uh, many areas have become pedestrianised, perhaps uh, temporarily, hopefully for longer term. There's been all kinds of pop up pedestrian zones and cycle paths and such like and you know what that's wonderful but how can we celebrate that without actually being aware that you know it's come from a place of trauma you know I don't want to score points over you know dead bodies and we have to face you know the pandemic has been an awful terrible tragedy um, we've lost loiterers to it and I know that many people have suffered greatly and terribly and there will be a need to be um sensitive and admit our vulnerabilities and admit our hurt and and be there for each other in a way that we have been online but it's very different you know um and that also reminds me you know i'm somebody that has really missed hugging people and it's always been important that hugging is consensual but i'm really conscious that that consent may be harder to navigate when i first see people again that i haven't seen for a while you know i suspect my brother is not the only person who's quite glad to have an excuse now maybe that um you know i think there will be all kinds of questions that arise and i think amongst this i wonder you know has our duty of care implicitly changed I, I think not i think it's the same duty but i think it has many new dimensions and it's more visible now perhaps than it ever has been and more understood by many other people um and actually in terms of those physical barriers i spoke of earlier i think uh sadly i think long covid and people's experiences of illness may also change some of the uh barriers that we faced um did blake to conclude yeah and i just 
two things that I want to pop up from what Morag said, and one, one of which is about this notion of trespass and sort of the, the, the radical trespass and radical psychogeographers. Well, as a walking artist in America, when I was an American citizen, white, middle class, you know, able to put on my best, like, oh, yes, officer, that's very nice. I'm sorry. We were making art kind of voice and knowing how to navigate all that as an American citizen of a certain upbringing. Well, when I got to England and I was on a visa, suddenly it was like, oh, no, I can't go to that protest. I can't trespass in that place. I need to make sure that I'm not doing anything that might get me deported. Um, and that really changed my positionality and my understanding of of those different kinds of access and what might seem really cool and radical and edgy and subversive is actually really inaccessible and really not inclusive and there are much better ways to maybe make those interrogations happen. Um, the other thing that happened was while Morag and I were working on this pedestrian provocations um, paper, I had the opportunity to go to Huntley as the thinker in residence for Deborah and Project's slow marathon. And that year, it was a collaboration between May Murad and Rachel Ashton. And Rachel was in, lives in Huntley, and May Murad lives in Gaza. And so, again, the positionality there of the borders was so radically different. And the Slow Marathon, if you're not familiar with it, is a 26, 26 mile, 26 mile walk. Um, that is, it's the length of a marathon you walk at, you spend all day walking it. it originally came out of um, Mira Kibeti's project when she wanted to walk from Ethiopia, from Addis Ababa to Huntley, but because of visa restrictions, terrain restrictions, that wasn't a realistic thing to do. So they decided to do an accumulative marathon. Um, and so they, so then every year since then, there's been this 26 mile walk in, in Huntley and they've been able to do all these different routes through Scotland. Well, when they were trying to plan a 26 mile walk in Gaza, they found it actually literally impossible. There was not 26 miles you could walk. So they had to repeat sections over and over again. They had to take a bus between different sections. And so I think thinking one of the things that walking with people globally through local practice has done for me is it's made so apparent how different spaces are policed differently and how our positionality as walkers comes into the way that we interact with those spaces. And again, I'm a, I'm a queer male, but I don't, I often can pass when I'm walking on the street because I don't perhaps have the markers of a stereotypically gay man as I walk through the streets. And I have found that when I have been dressed in my purple trousers and my rabbit fur coat and, you know, looking quite camp, I'm interacted with differently, you know, and I'm treated differently and I'm harassed or not harassed differently. And that those kinds of choices to ha on how we present ourselves are not choices everyone has, um, depending on where you are, who you are, and how you are. And so I think that that is, that duty of care, that, that building of community, that's all in some ways come more into focus um, throughout this experience of the lockdown and, and these differences. Um, and I, I think that I mean, Morag and I can probably both go on rambling and um, talking and, and, and thinking, but I, I think we'd also, unless you have anything else to add, we'd be happy to open it up to, um, to the conversation. Yeah, I, I think my final, my final point, and this is quite a, a brief one, but it's quite a big question, I think, to wrestle with is that idea of, you know, does or can every walk have to be for everyone, you know, and how do we ensure kind of multiple points of access to different kinds of walks and multiple possibilities so that different bodies, different people are able to uh, take part in creative walking in ways that suit and support and inspire and provoke them and start kind of new and different conversations. And I think for me, at the heart of you know psychogeography and and lots of multiplicity um, in all things and appreciating the different needs, different spaces of bodies. Um, and yeah, I think that's my final comment. And I'm really looking forward to questions and maybe some answers to questions. I think we've asked a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Blake and Morag. That was uh, very insightful and um, a joy to listen to. Um, for those in the room, you have a question mark. You can do things. You can physically raise your hand, but many people are without video, so that means you have to first put on, turn on your video. I know Bob already has a question. I'll get to you, Bob, in a minute.
Um, you can also uh, raise your hand uh, under the people tab uh, on the right side of your screen, then it will pop up and um, I will call you out. Uh, or you can um, uh, ask a question in the chat, or you can simply jump in if you feel uh, that you are not uh, being given the spotlight in time. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, go wild. Uh, I also have a few questions. Uh, well, I've got more than a few, but I'll uh, limit my first few uh, uh, so that others also have the opportunity to jump in. Um, first, a very practical one uh, for both of you. You, um, meant, uh, I think it was Blake who mentioned the data deserts or tech deserts, I mean, you might have mentioned, call them, I don't remember. So places where people don't have access to technology or data. Um, uh, how, my question is, uh, uh, have you come up with a, um, a tool or a technology to reach these people who are in these data deserts? And related to this, for both of you, what, in your opinions, is the technology that you have found is most suited to use for the purposes that you've described? Um, I mean, I think for me personally, the answer is no, I do not have a good, like, I think this is a question that Morag said. It's like if you if you're actually in a, a digital desert and you really don't have access, you don't even have access to knowing about what we're doing. You know, so that's that's another big question is like how do we as we come out of lockdown, how do we engage with communities? And this isn't just about digital. I remember um the very first walking project I did, the Untitled Walk project back in 2008, um was in New York City and my friend was working at a marketing firm that is an entirely African-American marketing firm. And she was telling him my project and they went, oh, that's white people art. And I was, <laughs> you know, and I had this moment where I, this just came up on my Facebook memories today where I saw that and I was like, oh yeah, it totally, it totally was in a way, you know, in terms of that point of access. So it's not, so there's all sorts of ways that like my work right now is not necessarily inviting in people who aren't already interested or don't already have cultural capital of a certain kind where they can understand this kind of conceptual walking work. Um, so I think that, that that's something that, yeah, figuring out how to get into those places that aren't digitally connected is very important. And I think there's nothing that beats just being on the ground and in person. Um, and of course, th those places where their digital deserts are more pronounced are not in the states in the UK. You know, it's in, in the wider developing, developing world yeah. or whatever term is being used currently um, to, you know, those are the places that really, I, I, don't, I don't know how to access. So yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but those are kind of my thoughts. And I, I mean, for me, this is still a relatively new question because my work uh, with the LRM has been so deeply embedded in a physical place that actually does have some quite extreme pockets of deprivation and digital poverty uh, relative, you know, in a relative to the UK kind of place. And I think when we're, literally on the streets, um, that's the best way of engaging anyone. And the majority of our walks will often have somebody uh, join us because they've seen what we're doing and they're curious, you know. And I think those interactions and those um, in situ invitations are really what, what we thrive on. And I spend a lot of time, you know, I've spent the last 20 something years of my life mostly walking across various, various areas of Manchester very slowly, talking to people. I'm one of those annoying people who says hello a lot and asks questions because that's what I do. It's what I like to do. And I think that has helped to some extent. And I also think the language that we use is very important. Like with the LRM, we don't use, I don't use the word psychogeography. I don't talk about walking art particularly. I don't walk, talk about creative walking because these are not interesting to many people. You know, I'm very conscious of accessible language and I don't claim to always get that right and I do think that I've been slightly surprised that feels the wrong word I didn't expect to be working in the virtual world for so long so it's been very ad hoc and experimental and making up as we go along you know and I, I definitely know we made some mistakes and I definitely know we could be reaching more people I should also say here that I'm not especially techie in lots of ways and because lots of my work suddenly switched to zoom etc as well the last thing I want to do for fun is is look at a screen sometimes um so there is no perfect answer for us either what what person who's worked with the LRM has been as I said we chose to use WhatsApp um there are ethical issues to it but it was relatively 
uh, easy to install and free to use, and most people were already using it. I should say I had never used WhatsApp before the pandemic began, so um, I was learning, but that's been something that people have preferred. But I do put things out on Twitter as well. And as I said, I've we usually work from word of mouth now. And so when people have asked, I said I will text things to them. Um, I started a project of sending out postcards, people that wanted post at, at one point in lockdown as well. Um, and I communicate via various groups that happen to already be part of. So I, I think it's not enough. But equally, we all operate under our own restrictions as well. So um, I think we would, yeah, be really up for new ideas of technology as well. Oh, in the past, this obviously hasn't worked particularly well in COVID, but I've put um, zines or postcards or things I've created in public spaces for people to find as well. Um, and, you know, various other techniques like that. Um, that's cool. Uh, and pointing out, I think it was Blake earlier, the corporate gatekeeping, or maybe it was you, Morag, um, although you use different words for it, where uh, Twitter, for example, is not uh, the public space that some think it is. It is gatekept by, by corporate, and not them. And although uh, people like us will unlikely uh, walk into, uh, run into problems with um, being deplatformed uh, off Twitter, but um, uh, we might uh, off Facebook and we will have recourse to fight back, right? Because it's not a democratic platform. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, Bob, you had a question uh, as well. You yes. were first to have a question. Go for it. How, how do individual walks relate to social walking? Now, I want to quote an example of individual walking. In 1905, Baroness Elsa, 1874 to 1927, for comparison. So I just read... Uh, Tired of conventional dressing, she began creating costumes which resulted in her arrest wherever she appeared upon the streets. Tired of official restraint, she leapt from patrol wagons with such agility the police let her go in admiration. Baroness, the Baroness captivated New York's modern urbanite world with her shocking and unsettling poses. Her head, shaved and occasionally shellacked in striking colours like vermilion red, her makeup, yellow face powder, black lipstick, and an American stamp on her cheek. Her jewels, utilitarian, mass produced objects like teaspoons as earrings or large buttons as fingers. Her accessories, tomato cans and celluloid rings adorning her body. The hem of her skirt decorated with horse blanket pins. An electric battery trail, trail light decorates the bustle of her black dress in imitation of a car or bicycle. She also used live animals as part of her street performance. A wooden birdcage around her neck housing a live canary. Five dogs on her gilded leash as she promenaded up Fifth Avenue. Her outrageous costumes made her a New York landmark at subway stations, in public offices, in museums, at exhibitions in department stores and on major thoroughfares. With each new day, she added a new twist to her repertoire of makeup, headdresses and costumes that were frequently made from junk objects collected in the street. Like her body, her art was androgynous, feminine in attracting the viewer's gaze to the female body, masculine in producing an unexpected shock effect. How? That's an individual thing. How does the uh, social walking expand that and, and, and broaden it? What are the, you know, what is the positives of, of social walking, which uh, I hear, I, if I've understood you correctly, this is what you're presenting. For me, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of that long passage you were taking. I'm not familiar with that individually, so I'm sorry if I'm slightly tangential, but um, as I think what we're both talking about here is one part of a bigger practice. So, for example, as an individual, I walk on my own, sometimes performatively, sometimes provocatively. I often um, enjoy elaborate costumes as part of that and the reactions they provoke. Um, but for me, social walking is about those or collective walking is about those conversations between each other and between the environment because I'm more interested in building a community than working as an individual. And I 
Um, I noticed a comment, I can't remember who, who it is, but they were saying perhaps not using the word psychogeography. And the reason I talk about psychogeography sometimes is entirely from my kind of political background as a kind of anarchist, but I mentioned the idea of, you know, I find the flaneur the most tedious person on the planet. You know, that single, lone, always a man, always privileged, always, you know, heteronormative and able-bodied and privileged in multiple ways, you know. And I think the idea of walking through space unaffected and unaffecting is a, is a complete myth. We don't exist in vacuums. And to me, uh, perhaps tellingly, my background is a community development worker and, a, and an activist as much as an artist that I think I'm much more interested in what happens when we talk to each other and perhaps more importantly when we listen and when we pay attention to the environment and the clues that are there and who's not there and we think about these questions of power both in ourselves and in the environment and you know there are myriad ways of walking I don't think one's better than the other but the way that I choose to do it tends to be um, in that collective and as I'd say as non-hierarchical as possible, I don't think it's possible to be non-hierarchical when somebody's arranging a meeting point or, you know, doing the admin or whatever. Uh, that's another thing that's changed slightly um, as we've gone on digital. But um, I, I hope, I mean, I'm interested in Blake's answer as well, um, but I hope that answers at least part of your question. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, I, I think more like it very much I would echo a lot of what she said in terms of collective and individual. And one of the arguments I make in my book, um, and per perhaps uh, what, what if in Phil Smith's review, he said maybe I, he appreciated my overcorrection perhaps, um, but that I'm not as interested in the performative aspects of walking as I am interested in, in the experience of the walk itself. So for me, a work of, in the medium of artist, uh, the, an artistic work in the medium of walking has to be experienced by the audience as a walk that watching someone else walk down the street with five dogs, it might be a really interesting, provocative, public performance, but it's not in the artistic medium of walking. Now, I am uh, familiar with the, the Baroness, and uh, unfortunately, too recently, and um, I guess she is now the, the person that created the most famous piece of modern art and has never been credited for it. Um, because she is the person who's actually responsible for Marcel Duchamp's fountain. Um, it's a piece that he, he took from her. So er, again, the historical record's a little bit hazy there, but much of the proof seems to indicate that she had been working with ready-mades for a very long time, and that that work was hers in, in a kind of a throwaway, and he took credit for it. And so that, in terms of my other sort of longer walking scholarship, just thinking about all of these invisible women who have been doing the work and not necessarily um, getting the credit for it in the historical record. So I think that's a really, I, I'm glad to be able to point that out because I have to remind myself often that that is how the, the history is being reshaped. And you know, and of course, for me, one of the most famous examples of this is Dorothy Wordsworth, where you know the daffodils dancing in William Wordsworth poem is directly pulled from her journals um, and that there's all sorts of examples of Wordsworth's walking actually being Dorothy Wordsworth as opposed to William Wordsworth, and the sense of there's all these collaborations where the man remains visible and the woman becomes invisible, and I feel like that's so important to continue to correct. And actually, I think that I, I absolutely thank you, and I really appreciate that. And I do think um, it's a problem we face actually sometimes as authors. Like I feel like. LRM walks are participatory events that are co-produced by everyone. But actually, interestingly, I I own it now. You know, I put my name to it. I, I make this thing happen, partly because when it was just the LRM, there was an assumption that I was a man. I got really irritated. And there are still people who think that I am, who, who get really confused that I'm not Mark Thomas or I'm not... Um, CPLA or various other quite specific men because how could I be doing this and that frustrates me constantly and I think we need to be aware and I do think you know there's been an, a lot of amazing work over recent years around um, making visible um, women walking and um, you know a series of really great events that were 
facilitated by um, Claire and Amy and Dean and others that I think um, are worth looking at. But there are also still other dimensions, you know, as we mentioned, primarily, um, you know, a white space, primarily a educated space, primarily all kinds of things that we need to be addressing. And I think we need to um, always keep looking for that. And, and, and I think it was um, Alec Finley who said something like um, there can never be an excess of access. And I think that's a great line when we think of access is about all kinds of things but if we are obsessed with the singular great walker we're always imposing a, a narrative that ignores a lot of other people and a lot of other events and that doesn't mean that those you know walks we take on our own or that we see other people take are meaningless but i think it's always more interesting to think about those interrelations and codependencies thank you very much In the article, uh that professed, prefaced, prefaced um, our meeting today. Uh, um, Morag, you uh, characterized uh, walking as a, uh, that there's neo-colonial edge to walking. And uh, uh, Blake, uh, you reflected that with uh, the neoliberal model of walking. Uh, no, no, I don't think there's a neo-colonial edge to walking. I think there's often a neo-colonial edge to quite a lot of psychogeography and walking up when it lays claim to uh, literature that talks about investigating space or penetrating space or laying claim to a single totalizing uh, one definitive notion of space. I think that is really problematic because I think we share whatever space we're in, you know, we share the street. And um, I should also, you know, my work is almost entirely concerned with pavements and public space that are by definition shared. So to say this place is just for me is to me deeply troubling it's about how we share how we open up how we make that a more open space and i think that does conflict with neoliberal agendas of privatization and securitization and commercialization and making high streets for example look the same and for me that desire to keep spaces open to potential and to all kinds of audiences absolutely key to my work an individual walk may not make that apparent particularly when we're in different places and there's a social connection to people that need it you know so you might come to an LRM thing and not even pick up on that and that's fine but to me um we have to keep out and I speak to speak to that as somebody who you know is often not welcome in places for all kinds of reasons um and others of us will share that experience but yeah that's what I was talking about I don't think walking in itself is you know neo-colonial that that, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. Well, and I, I think if I'm remembering the section of the, the article correctly, I think this is actually a place where I was giving a critique of living streets and that was, was really yep. That's a, it. A, a saying that, you know, this is this just a neoliberal model, you know, and, and Morag very um, gently, <laughs> you know, said, I see what you're saying, but I think maybe you're being <laughs> a little bit harsh and that maybe you should think a little more pragmatically about that. Um, and of course, in the editing process, that is something that I could have said was embarrassing to me, and so we cut out. But I thought that um, that making visible that like we both make statements that we then have interrogated by someone else, and we we change our point of view. That that's that's a really important process, actually. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that there are things. You know, when I read anything I've written in the past and I go back and I read it, I think, oh, I wasn't quite on there. You know, I was still working out that idea. That that wasn't that didn't quite work. Um, and I, I'm moving and adjusting and, you know, happy for those corrections. And I think that that's challenging. Um, and the thing that I've had to work on, it's sort of in my growth as a human, uh, taking all of that sort of constructive feedback and not being personal about it or not feeling attacked. But learning how to grow, um, and you know, when you have people like Morag that are that are so so lovely in the way that they have these conversations, at least with me, I'm sure there are people who <laughs> might not agree with that statement of loveliness. Um, but <laughs> it's easier to do that gently. But I think it's about. I try to remember that for all of my interactions, I suppose, even when I'm getting really frustrated or annoyed because someone doesn't see something how I do, you know, taking taking those points of radical empathy and understanding and, and willingness to adjust positionality. Thank you, Blake. I, I think it's quite correct to say that I'm not always that lovely, but I do try. Um, I think 
and, and actually to return to living streets i've forgotten that's but yeah so for example they do lots of work on encouraging children to walk to school and making streets safer so they have campaigns on things like pavement parking that you know isn't particularly sexy or creative but actually is really important because if cars are all over the pavement then that is a an absolute barrier so um we might have issues with um uh, it, it's that thing we don't live in a perfect world you know there are so many things wrong um at the moment that need fixing that i'd rather um look for those points of commonality and work together on those kind of bigger um fights actually rather than um you know uh, oppose things like that and um yeah thanks uh, we sadly uh, only have uh, one fiona in our midst today um but that make it e makes it easier to uh, to address her uh, she had a question on uh, the practicality um uh, of uh, your construction of your scores fiona do you want to ask the question yourself Okay. Um, it was. I was basically wondering when more ag you say you 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 make careful curatorial decisions about your different walks. Um, you've you've mentioned a lot of sensitivities that you might have to take into account and to be holistic in putting that walk together. I was just kind of imagining this giant spreadsheet of a health and safety risk <laughs> assessment. Uh, right. You know, have I ticked all the boxes? And I guess I'm kind of asking because I did probably my second uh, group walk at the weekend and it was um, something that I only realised afterwards that I hadn't really done a health and safety <laughs> assessment at all, apart from deciding that the, the person who was um, had walking difficulties would lead the walk and I would walk at the back. So we didn't really... Um, think beyond that so it's it's really interesting that you raise these points but I'm like what what have I missed what do I need to think about okay um so first of all there is no one giant spreadsheet um maybe I shouldn't admit that um but I think a lot of what you need is a, a kind of reflexivity as you go along and I would separate this out into a few different things so first of all on a on a normal first Sunday with the LRM um Many of the activities, because we walk as a group, I don't know where we're going to go, so I can't do a recce in that way. But we cultivate the idea that everyone looks out for each other, and if anybody is uncomfortable somewhere, we stop. And we, it, it kind of works in a very organic and reflexive way. And um, I think that the ethos of the group has sort of developed in that there's always some people that have been before that know to keep out. And, and it's worked. To me, that's what the community building is about, you know? Um, it's different to the times when sometimes we do, I, I do do more kind of performative walking tours. And, and if I do that, I always make clear that they are participating and people can argue with me and they're not, they're not conventional kind of blue badge tours. They always have elements in them that are, are different. Now for those, I usually do do some kind of recce. So I'll walk the route in advance and make sure there are things like, um, drop curbs and seats at some points and, um keeping away from busy areas so we're not pavement blocking um and such like and i think key actually is being honest when you start that walk to make clear that actually this walk is roughly x duration that includes some steps or includes whatever and, and it's probably quite helpful that because everything i do takes place within greater manchester people are usually familiar with the places we're going you know um but i think there is that need to be constantly reflexive constantly alert and if we do have a large group um i will normally there'll normally be two or three people that i know really well that i'll maybe sometimes i will then keep an eye out um but we do place a large element on taking care of each other and that is something that goes out in pretty much every invitation that i give um having said i don't do risk assessments occasionally i've had to so for example, for festivals or when I was doing my um, PhD kind of walks with women, I then had to do a risk assessment, um, which, you know, I'm used to that box ticking because I, I worked in the voluntary sector for a really long time and helped a lot of community centres with 
health and safety and stuff like that. So um, there was a joke for a long time that I'm the only anarchist that can help you fill in your tax form um, because of the kinds of stuff I was doing in a day job. So I can, you know, I can put that head on me and I will know not to put people at risk, you know. So I'll sometimes occasionally have to stop. So when I was walking with women for that interview, there'll be a couple of times when I had to say, I'm really sorry, we can't go there because it's not safe or it's not appropriate here. Um, and when I talked about things like urban exploration, we don't do that on a first Sunday. People that come make connections with other people that do, or I may do those things when I'm not responsible for a group. You know, it's that duty of care stuff that I just think is really important and deep, but it's quite hard to put one tick box on. Um, just uh, can I quiss oh, oh. yeah, sure. I no, no. Quickly ask, like, um, because ours was a uh, women walking, and it was in a way a provocation. Um, um, do you uh, advise people on um, that kind of harassment that you might get or comments or people coming up to talk to you? Yeah, I mean, in informally, I might do when I when I did my uh, academic kind of interviews, walking with women, I, I mean, I'm used to uh, conversations in the street. I get a lot less harassment now because I'm, you know, fatter and older and bolshier than I was when I, you know, I notice actually a couple of times a year and I apologize if it spoils anyone's image of me. I have to dye my hair blonde so it then goes back to its natural pinkness. And I notice actually when I'm blonde, I will always get harassed. It's really irritating, really frustrating how superficial things can be. But what I hadn't expected actually was how two women in a microphone was an absolute magnet for wing nuts. We got an awful lot more harassment than I would ordinarily expect, you know. And I remember talking to my supervisor because within the research context, this felt like an unacceptable risk. But what do you do? Do you say, I'm scrapping my work? Um, we didn't. And I, I, you know, I trusted in the people who I was walking with had all volunteered. They'd, they'd got in touch with me and said, I'd like to walk with you. Some of them had actually wanted to walk with me because they'd experienced some quite traumatic experiences and wanted to say that they kept walking as a woman. So it was actually about having alert skills about making some changes in that, for example, avoided going out doing interviews on a Friday afternoon or evening because that was the time, prime pisshead time, forgive my language. Um, and just having, I, I don't know, spidey sense for want of a better word, where you kind of know what's around. And I think actually women and, and doubtless other people here as well for different reasons, but I, I've never met a woman who doesn't know what it's like to be hyper alert and to adopt a certain kind of walk that puts people off or has a key in their hand or a whatever or whatever. So those tactics, I mean, I, I say this many times, it shouldn't be radical to simply go for a walk, but far too often it is. Um, in terms of the box ticking and advice, I actually just wrote something for um, undergraduates about uh, using psychogeography and such like. Um, so if anyone wants to see that article, it looks at some of the um, risks in a kind of language I wouldn't not necessarily use, but trying to make it accessible. So I'm more than happy to send that to anyone if they want to. I'll put my um, email in the uh, in the chat. Um, and if there's any, you know, particular questions I can help with, I'll, I'll do my best. But it is very much um, knowing your environment, keeping alert and being honest and being protective if people need it, but also trusting in individuals that you're walking with to some extent. Um, and I think just thinking about risk assessment, the risk assessment is often not the duty of care towards the walkers, right? You're feeling a yeah. risk assessment as a duty of care towards the insurance people and towards the yeah. organization because they need to be protected that you've done this risk assessment if anything goes wrong. And so, of course, I think a risk assessment you know, can be a really important tool, but I think more often than not, the way that it's used is, is to protect, is not to protect yeah. the people on the walk, actually. Um, and I, maybe that's a very cynical way of thinking about it, but that, that has been my experience, I think. Um, and that I feel like that duty of care often on these group walks is very much about sh making sure that we're in this together and that we're not, you know, leaving people behind, that we're, it's that flexibility and awareness as you go through the walk. And of course, making sure everyone understands that from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at <laughs> these weird risk assessment for the walking library. Yeah. 
I've had a few strange mitigations needed over the years as well when I've been doing tours for festivals and such like. Um, and yeah, sometimes you do just need to keep away from an area if you're responsible for other people. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Deirdre, uh, your question on coding, was it also related about uh, preparation? Um, I wanted, I didn't understand, I didn't know that I didn't understand. I wanted to hear your interpretation of the instructions on your provocation manifesto about like coding the barriers or supports um, in the instructions that you gave out, like and what that actually might have looked like when you did that. Did you do it? Did you do the exercise yourself? Like, just uh, we, what yeah, that we, meant in practice, really, your interpretation of your own instructions, I guess. Um, one of the ones that stands out for me the most in terms of the code was that every time we came across the bumps on a sidewalk, we had to walk very slowly. So, like, if, if you're crossing, what are, what are they called? The tactile paving, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it's yep. called. We're crossing tactile paving, slow down, slow down more, slow down as much as possible. Um, there was another one that we had about like anytime you hear the beeps of a crossing light, you know, that, that is, that's a signal to turn right. I don't remember exactly what it was actually at this moment, but it was like, if you hear the signal of a crossing okay. walk, so go in a circle, turn around. Um, I think there was even once where we were like sing a song to the, you know, to the, <laughs> so yeah. That was what it was about. It was about saying, all right, not only are we identifying these supports and barriers, but then we're engaging with and reacting to them in some way. Okay. That understanding. Mm. And actually, I think those prompts, we were talking about them today because I haven't seen them for a while. Um, and they are an interesting mix of, I think those of you that know me and know Blake can spot the bits that we've written. And then there's other bits that absolute merging the two of us and we can't, well, I can't remember who suggested some of them but yeah they were um designed to make us really aware of those things and i mainly recall being stuck on one particular block for a really long time because the instruction we'd got for i think it might have been a cone but i walked around the same block about three times and in the end i was like Do you know what i'm going to cheat because this code is just going to keep turning me around and uh, yeah when I, I had the same experience we both got into this we, i think we called it the walking vortex like oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Vortex that we couldn't escape. And it makes me, I was just, one of the projects I did for the Untitled Walk project back in 2008 was we did this walk um, where we play Rochambeau. So we'd ask someone on the street to play rock, paper, scissors with us. And if rock won, we went right. If paper won, we went left. If you know, scissors won, we went straight. And if it was a tie, you walked back the way you came. Well, let me tell you, rock, paper, scissors almost always ends up in a tie. So when you're only playing the one round, I mean, we literally just kept walking back. It's like, oh, gosh, we just don't want to keep walking the same pathway anymore. You know, but but there was also something about like these codes. They do they do reveal something about the relationship to the space. And we were happy to change them if we needed to. Yeah, it's so true. Like LRM codes on first Sundays, there was a time when we always ended up in car parks, no matter what you do, which I think tells you something about the situations of walkers and space in the city. But for a while, there was a joke that, you know, what do you do on a, on a derive with Morag? Oh, you hang around a car park until somebody tells you to get out of the way. <laughs> I'm doing a master's in performing public space right now, and I'm walking a lot. So I was curious about um, using scores kind of um, um, as a way to share a walk, and I was curious about your sort of ideas on that as a documentation process too. Yeah. Like, um, go, go ahead if you have another point to that question. Sorry, I was just going to say sort of like as a way to share it as research and as sharing the piece in a way. I guess for me, I think about the scores really uh, as an invitation. So, you know, that's the key thing they function as. But then, I until I did the 52 scores project, I don't think I'd ever actually created a physical object in relation to my walks. I think that's like the first project I've ever done that you could put in a gallery, you know, in like a proper, like, you could have a display of the 52 scores in the gallery. I just had never made work like that. But 
for me, those walking scores aren't complete at all unless you go do the walk. So if you're just looking at them as, as it's like seeing an invitation to a party and not going to the party. It's like, well, the party was the thing. The invitation was just what got you there. So I guess that's how I'm thinking about the scores is that they are a, they're a document of that invitation that continues to live. But the, the real relationship is the, the walk itself. And, you know, and this has been a, the, the first way I started documenting my walks was through memory palaces, um, which is an ancient Greek technique for memory where you create strong visual uh, images and you place them in a space and then you walk in that space throughout your mind. So that was a way for me to think about, oh, how can I document the walk through the act of walking? And that's always what I've been interested in. Like I want, I want the, the document of the walk to be a walk. And so then after, you know, the other thing I started really getting into besides memory palaces was this idea of the instruction as a response. And this is something that Morag and I really played with a lot, right? So we go on a walk and we say, all right, if we wanted to give someone else an idea of what we experienced on our walk, how would we codify that into an instruction that they could go do? And then it becomes kind of this iterative process of like, I had a walk, this was my experience, I've created an instruction for you, now you go and do that instruction and there's a back and forth. Cool, thank you. Um, and Morag, my family calls them squizzles. Fantastic. Where, where, <laughs> may I ask where your family are from, roughly? Anson. Okay. Oh, cool. So just up the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Excellent. That's made me delighted. It's like uh, squirrels and also um, ginnels from where we are, but Twitten's where I grew up. I feel like dialect words for alleys are, are great universal conversation starters. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Adam, you had a suggestion um, uh, for an alternative way to um, uh, describe things that we typically use to um, describe with the term psychogeography. Social, social geography might be a better word than psychogeography, which happens completely in the head of an individual, ignoring the collective dimension of shared activity and collaboration, which isn't just sub, subversive, but constructively engaged. Um, for me, and this is a very personal answer, I don't think psychogeography is just in the head of the individual. I think we can go back um, to think about the, the definition from De Boer and the situationists, which they themselves said was, you know, pleasingly vague. And we can see how it's developed over the years. And um, I'm going to have to be brief here because I've literally uh, written thought far too much about this over the years. But my decision within the LRM was always designed to be a collective psychogeography. Because, again, in that kind of anti flaneur kind of idea, because I don't think psychogeography has to be an individual pursuit. And indeed, there's an awful lot wrong with the SI, as we've hinted at already, you know, certainly in terms of occult language and neocolonialism and, and misogyny and such like. So I don't defend them at all. But the way psychogeography has um, developed over the years, you know, there is the kind of history of the sort of more activist groups. So in Manchester, our immediate predecessors were. Manchester area, psychogeographic, so we sort of nodded to them. Uh, there's also the kind of more literary and um, walking art angles. And to be honest, I still have problems with the word, but, and I think a lot of people, so for example, Tina Richardson's schizogeography, Bill Smith's mythogeography, um, Nick Papa Dimitri's deep topography, they're all getting at something and they're all valid and all great. And I didn't want to get too hung up on the semantics. And the reality is psychogeography, certainly at the time we started 15 years ago, first of all, keyed in with a lot of the kind of activist ideas of the time that were very um, situ inspired, however far removed from the original they might have been. And also because I was incredibly annoyed at that section in bookshops was entirely male dominated. And again, the flanner that's just boring to do much more interesting things. So um, and also. Um, Weirdly, at, at, at work in my day job, I teach social geography. So I think, to me, that means something different as well. But uh, that's another interesting semantic discussion we've gone for ages. I'm going to mute myself or I'll be here until midnight because it's fascinating, that one. And thank you so much for the question. And I'll just make a small point that I've never particularly identified my work as psychogeography because I never felt like it was activist enough. You know, to me, there's something about psychogeography that has to be engaging with the politics of space in a really specific way that I didn't feel comfortable that my work was, 
it, certainly it was it was engaging with some of those ideas some of the time or you know there there are aspects of psychogeography that draw, I draw in but I never felt like the, the there's there is a real politics to that situationist work um, that is is an activist politics in a lot of ways that I did not feel like I was aligning with enough to claim that mantle and I'm coming again in America where when I was developing this work you know in in 2008 that that tradition is really different. There isn't as strong a tradition of psychogeography as there is in the UK. I, I was going to say for me as well, say partly contrary, because as a disabled person, I was alienated from a lot of big capital A activist events. Like this was a time of a lot of camps, protest camps and such like that I simply couldn't take part in. And um, really, you know, I'm terrible at running from the cops because I can't run. But I don't want to put my friends at risk by having to wait for me. And I was getting quite irritated at being literally left out of a lot of activism. But also as a community development worker at the time, it was those conversations. And I think that the street is a good place for conversations. The environment, something gets sparked, you know, so it's really a tool and a starting point. And I would say that for me, the term was more of an inspiration than a definite rule book. Um, and that pleasingly vague, I think, was always really important anyway. Um. No, thanks. Uh, in response to Blake, and Blake, you're not um, thinking your work as um, uh, reactionary enough. Um, what you think in the United States is by design a, a revolutionary act, because every street in the United States is designed for cars, not for people. Yes, absolutely. And there is a... Um, Although, to be fair, again, the context of my walking was in New York City, which if there's any city in the United States that is a walking city, this is, I'm in the one. Um, of course. So, yeah. so there is that. And of, of course, when I do walks in Fresno, the, yes, the very active, like leading a walk in Fresno, which is a suburban conservative town, um, that does feel a little subversive or radical. But I don't know that it... I don't know. I don't know that I ever felt comfortable claiming the mantle um, of an activist practice. And I think this is something that Morag and I talk about in the article too, in terms of like, for me, the most interesting art is opening up questions and ideas that can then be translated into a kind of activism. But that activism has a goal that is is more specific than the kind of mm -hmm. open question ideas that I was thinking about in terms of my art. And again. Those are contested definitions. My view and idea of what these words mean is not the right view. It's just the one that I am operating from. Oh, totally oh, agree. And we're asking you, right? Yeah. I was gonna say I, I agree with Blake and I think these words mean lots of different things. So often the most impactful things I've done as a springboard from walking has been things like um legal battles around public space, which is a very different kind of access and aspect to walk in but it all feeds into those ideas i don't think things mean one thing you know i think um there should be room for all those different definitions and we're all more than one kind of action i think i find it very hard to describe what i do for all these reasons and i'm sure that other people in the room feel the same as well you know it, resist the idea of just one label no. Thanks. Um, Andrew, uh, we have lost, um, it ah. seems. Uh, he had a few questions. One was a practical one uh, for Morag. What constitutes mm -hmm. a large group of people when the LRM um, uh, wanders in person? Um, it depends on the event, to be honest. Uh, we never can predict. I think the largest that we've ever had on an event was around um, about 85, I think. Um, the smallest number that's ever turned up is maybe six or eight. There's never been a time yet where nobody's turned up. Um, so, yeah, it, it really depends. If the time that 80 people turned up, you can't do one walk with those people. It's just not possible. And that's why that wider duty of care is important, you know, because I can't be watching or guiding or, but, you know, all those people. So. Um, that's where the communal aspect comes in. I guess the average is usually between around um, 12 and 30 is more normal, but um, 
mm -hmm. we'll often break up then um, and come back at the end, like the important idea? conversation. Yeah. Do you have any idea what um, the group size is now that you've uh, moved to uh, an online format? Uh, no. And again, it really uh, it varies. I don't know how to measure it because the WhatsApp conversations will usually be, again, it depends, but say maybe around uh, 12 to 15, again, some months smaller, some others, but then other people will get in touch later to say that they followed the scripts um, through Twitter or personally and didn't feel comfortable sharing their pictures publicly. So, um, and I, I know that other people, because I'll see the stats of who's read them, whether they use them or not is another matter. So I've never been that bothered in the numbers, to be honest. Um, and I think, Times when we've had exhibitions or more statutory things and we're looking at engaging in terms of feet through the door, it's like several thousand. I think it was um, that came. We had a, our 10th anniversary was like something crazy, like 20,000 people. But whether or not they had any impact, I don't know. I'm more maybe interested sometimes in the one person who'd never really knew what we were doing and joined a walk because they stumbled upon us, you know, while we were out. So, sorry, that's a terrible answer and a long ramble but um please tell andrew that i realize he left quite a few questions if he wants to talk about them he's more than happy to to get in touch with me i'm always well, interested I'll pick in out one more of his, his, um, which uh, was uh, on the uh, walks of mothers with children beyond the buggy age whether mm -hmm. you walked uh, did lockdown walks with these or um, uh, whether there's research um, on on these uh, well there's definitely lots of research on um walking with children, I would say not just mothers. Um, I don't, you know, I, I would say carers and stuff. And actually, Living Streets have done lots of work on walking with children. Um, Claire Quorman's really excellent perambulator projects. Um, for me, I don't necessarily know who's sending me things through the WhatsApp messages. I don't always ask them. So if they tell me there's kids with them, yes, sometimes there are. Um, and certainly when we meet in real life, children are welcome and often come along I think they're naturally naturally get the purpose of the dream very often naturally get the ludic nature of things and will frequently and much to my joy take over the walk and guide people because their ideas are usually much more interesting than what I was going to say so I'm very happy for children to lead on it but yeah there's definitely a lot of research in that area um and certainly welcome but um also, the Women's Design Group have done lots of things with uh, lots of research in that area. I think Blake probably has stuff to add as well. I don't know. I mean, now that I, when you were saying those things, I did realize that some of some of the people that I am, have, have done my walks have taken their children with them. Mm -hmm. And I think those have mostly been people whose kids know me as well. And they can mm -hmm. be like, oh, you know, Blake, we're going to go on his art walk, you know, and it's like a fun thing. I don't know how... I don't know people whose whose children don't know me who have gone on my walks mm -hmm. in that way, um, and it, like more like said, it could they could have, but I don't I don't know. Um, yeah, no. I I don't ever ask people any kind of demographic information or or anything, and I don't necessarily want to. Obviously, it's obvious if there's a child on a walk, um, and there's one or two of the performance tours that I explicitly say are not for children because they engage with. Um, adult themes but generally we adapt and so for example at the end of an LRM walk we usually go for a drink somewhere of uh, people that want to they'll kind of gather and have a conversation and share what's happened to them and that's always really important but for example if there are kids then we always go somewhere that are child friendly you know our meeting points are always child friendly as well like we never meet in somewhere that isn't fully accessible um but we may end in other places depending on who's there. I, and I feel like that making clear that the meeting point is fully accessible. And this is something I became really aware of in London yeah. where like mm. most of the tube stations just aren't accessible. And so it becomes also about not only figuring out like, okay, which station is accessible, but which station is accessible and not a nightmare to get across the line on because of the way that you have to navigate it. Yeah, I think, there's something about asking as well, letting people know they can ask you if they've got any particular requirements, because there will be things we don't know about. You know, I'm 
can't I can't claim to be an expert in everybody's needs and you know we all learn and we all make mistakes as well sometimes and I think actually asking or giving permission for somebody to ask what to tell you and being open and honest about what's possible you know um I remember doing some work with a group of visually impaired people who wanted a tour of a particular area of Manchester and and I had to tell them it just wasn't possible in there for them all to go together because some of them had chairs that wouldn't fit in particular spaces and there was nothing I could do about that so we had to work together about um where else might we go instead or what else can we do or how can we relay the information that the other members of the group could experience in a way that doesn't feel exclusionary. Um, now, that was quite an odd walk for me because I was invited to take them round. It wasn't something I'd designed, but um, we, we have to work with the limits that we have. Um, and I think that honesty um, is really important. And that openness, I guess, is, again, part of that duty of care we were talking about, certainly for me. And I think, well, I know for Blake, too. Thanks. Um, if I hope I've addressed all um, participants' questions. Um, I have maybe one more question for both of you to, uh, to uh, conclude um, uh, the meeting with. Um, uh, if you have something to uh, comment on the question. The question is something that came up in the discussion that you had in the paper that uh, preceded this call, and it was how to link global places through local walks. Do you have um, something to comment on this? On this? Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think just that's a that is a good no notion to end on in terms of what I have been sort of consistently interested. And I guess in some ways I got lucky, it, you know, that, there, that, that my work was really focused on how do you create digital walks and and local global practice and. How do you make your local practice translate globally? I was already investigating, you know, more than I, we did this distance exchange walk, you know, two years before lockdown, you know, and suddenly there's a shift to everyone trying to go like, oh, what do I do? How do I do this? So there, there's some some ways that I suppose that was fortuitous. Um, but this is a, this is really, I'll, I'll come back to, I was really inspired by Jory Lassi um, and her book, World City. And this notion that the global isn't produced out there, but it's produced here, wherever you are. And that, of course, like New York City, London, Paris, Milan, you know, these kind of big global epicenters of culture, they take more credit for producing the global, right? They don't exist in a lack of conversation or in, with, with, they exist in all these places that don't get credit for producing the global that are just as involved and the global can't exist without. So I think that that's, that was one of the, one of the things that led me to digital walking. I mean, partially it's because I moved to England and I still wanted to walk with people that I walked with in America. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I had to adjust to that digital exchange because I, if I wanted to keep those communities growing in new places. Um, but, but yeah, I just think it's really, this is why what I found so fascinating about doing the walking scores, where you can have everyone starting in different cities and different towns and different locations using the same prompt, and you can, can start to compare the difference of those experiences. And to me, that's been really revelatory, and I hope for the people that have been walking with me, it has been as well. And the one, I guess the question that I haven't figured out that I'm still working on is how to not make myself the central mediator between these different people who are participating. So if I've got 15 people all responding to a score in lots of different places, how do you make it so that doesn't all have to go through me and that you can create exchanges with each other? Is, is it a WhatsApp group? Is it Telegram? Is it a Twitter? You know, it's, it's like, what is, I don't know yet. That's the thing I'm still trying to work out. Yeah, I, I think for me too, that's, that's a really central problem and question. And I think um, I too, I've also been like profoundly influenced by um, Doreen Mass's ideas in this way of the relationship between the local and the global. And for me, her really powerful idea of how space and place is entirely made up of relationships and constellations of relationships about how we are interlinked and how the local and global interact in a way that are 
distinct but also for me that vision is so profoundly progressive and radical so it makes a mockery of ideas like racism and of border control and such like because what matters are those links that we have but she's not uh, an idealist about it you know she's always very very attentive to power structures and I think that's what's valuable but also most importantly that she is really open that these are what she calls stories so far you know that the journey is not yet over and we have some individual power and in many times it's it's limited but actually the the, the journey is not done and the map is never complete and we can change how those stories develop and there is not one it's back to that simultaneity I'll, I'll finish with her idea of you know the simultaneous stories so far and I think that's um probably at the heart of what I do and I think what Blake does although um I hadn't yet read the book at the time I started walking in this way um, so, so we'll, we'll end as the Doreen Massey fan club here. Yeah. If you're not familiar with her or Morag yeah. and I both and, highly recommend Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm more than happy to share. I have some text and I've written a few things about her that if anyone's interested in, just get in touch and I'm happily will um, share with you. Um, yeah, thanks. <gasps> and thank you for the questions. And I have to say that your cat is adorable. I really want to know their name and reach out and give them a stroke. They're just uh... <laughs> This is Patrick or Mr. P. Hey, Mr. P. <laughs> Very stylish. <laughs> He's showing off. When he hears me uh, talk and he doesn't hear someone talking back, he assumes that I'm talking to him. Of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, all right. Thanks a lot for um, your talks today. Um, it was very illuminating to me. I hope uh, our attendees uh, thought the same. Oh, Mr. P. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, I hope there's enough uh, for all of us to think about. Uh, and uh, we welcome you all back at our next cafe. So thanks again, Blake and Morag. Uh, hope to Thank see you soon. And uh, yep. same for everyone else. Thank you so much for questions. And please get in touch if you want any uh, information and stuff. Okay, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank all. you. Thanks, bye. Ciao, ciao.